passage from the book of Exodus. Chapter 40, verse 34, the very last piece. Uh, I like to read from 34 to the end, and this is what the Word of God says. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was, fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Well, I must work with a little bit of a limitation of time this morning, uh, so I can't uh, read every passage that I'm going to refer to, but you'll have to follow with your mind wide open, uh, maybe even with some imagination of where we're going here with this passage. Uh, but let me, let me basically begin with this, that there is a completion. There was a completion of what is called a tabernacle. It, it is a, also called a holy tent or sanctuary. It was literally a tent made with some very special material that God had instructed uh, the skilled men uh, to build. And this was all done according to God's instruction that Moses received from Mount Sinai. And it wasn't just a tent. It had furnitures inside, this and that. Uh, most importantly, uh, there was the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, the deepest side of this tent. Uh, on top of it, we already talked about it, was the mercy seat, which was the great model of God's throne on the earth. And that's where people of Israel were supposed to experience the presence of God. So this was the Ark, and it took exactly one year from the time that the Israelites embarked out of Egypt in this Exodus journey. So after one full year, they were able to erect this tent. And uh, perhaps it took about nine months for them to actually construct it. I mean, it, it was, it was uh, probably not a huge tent, and you could see somewhat of a, of a measured model when you go to Lancaster, when you visit the Mennonite Center, they have a model of, of the tabernacle there. Uh, but it, it required quite a bit of detail, right? So uh, it took them a good amount of time to build it. And when finally it was being dedicated, that's the last chapter of Exodus, there comes this uh, glorious cloud that uh, descended upon this new tent, this tabernacle. And this cloud represents the very glorious presence of God with the people of Israel throughout the journey of the 40 years in the wilderness in the experience of deliverance by God's own hands. And as this happens, I, I, I want you to see these two images. One is the tent, or let's call it the sanctuary, and then there is this glory cloud that descends upon it, and uh, sometimes it's on top of it, but it also talks about how the glory fill the inside of the tabernacle as well. So just, just have these images in your mind. There's the tent and there's the glory cloud that's descending on it. Let me remind you, if you didn't know as you read through the, the book of Exodus, that the cloud appeared way before this time. The cloud appeared in the very beginning of the journey, a year ago from this point. The cloud was there fighting for them in the, 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 the great event of, of opening up the Red Sea like a dry land and crossing, and, and the, the Pharaoh's army was chasing behind them, and it was that, that glory cloud that, that made a room between the, the army that was chasing and the camp of Israel. It was the glory cloud that descended on Mount Sinai. It was the glory cloud that met Moses occasionally in what was called a temporary place of meeting, the, the tent of meeting. And then finally, this is what we see, the great glory of God descending upon this sanctuary. Okay, what should we say about this glory cloud? What can we talk about it? 
So I'm actually going to borrow a wonderful concept that I learned in the first year of seminary. And the concept comes from a gentleman named John Frame, and he's one of my favorite teachers who taught me over the years, and I also read a good amount of his books because he's a very prolific writer. And uh, you know about Gate Institute that Jubilee sponsors and, and, and I lead as one of the missionary endeavors, and John Frame was gracious enough to actually do a full lecture last summer online for us. He's already 93 years old, but he was so great and articulate and, and very clear. So anyways, he's a gifted theologian, and this man developed by God's grace, a Theology of Lordship series. So his focus is on the Lordship of God. That's a very important word, Lordship of God, that God is the Sovereign Lord, and he organized the entire theology under this theme. And there are three attributes of God's Lordship. This is what I learned from him, three attributes. And the attributes are, number one, authority, Number two, control. Number three, presence. So when God exercises lordship, you're going to see three attributes demonstrated by God. He will be present with His people. He will rule and control the very life of the people. Number three, He has the authority to do this. So let's, let's go through this uh, a little bit slower, okay? Okay, from the original order that I gave you, authority. What is an authority? Well, you see here in this passage, I think it reflects perfectly these three things. Verse 34 and 35 talks about how God completely filled the tabernacle and the surrounding with His glory. Glory is a, a illumination and the, the, the magnificent manifestation of God's supreme greatness. And this glory filled the tabernacle which meant that there was no room for anything else. Totally filled it, totally influenced it. And it said Moses, even Moses was not able to enter into the tabernacle because the glory of God filled it. And this is a very frequent occurrence in the Bible. Similar thing happens when Solomon builds the temple. And when that dedication takes place, the priests wanted to go inside and do the functions, but the glory cloud filled the temple and none of them could do the work. Remember the time when Peter and two other disciples were on the mountain and Jesus was transfigured or transformed? He, 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 he became glorious in appearance. And... Uh, uh, there was Moses and Elijah appearing next to, to Christ, and, and Peter was so overtaken by this, this moment, he didn't quite know what he was talking about. He said, oh, it is so good to be here. And Peter said, let's, let's build three uh, 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 tents, basically, uh, three uh, temporary housing in order that three of you can occupy each one and let us dwell here with you forever or for a long time. And then there was no answer at all because it was kind of silly, right? But at that time, it said the, the, the cloud completely covered that mountain. They were put under this cloud. And uh, Peter became absolutely silent. And then he heard a voice. This is my beloved son. This is Jesus Christ. Listen to him. You be quiet. Listen to him. Right? So, what happens here in this passage the, that we read earlier today, too, is that there is an absolute silence from the side of those that which is not God. God is the only one who is entitled to dominate this, this time because what? He has the authority to do this, do this. Nobody else can do anything without God's authorization. You know, when youth group go on a camping trip or some kind of retreat, we have authorization forms signed by the parents. That, meant, that means that without the authority or authorization of the parents, that authority cannot be transferred over to the teachers or the staff. In the same way, who holds the authority over all things? It's God. God holds the authority over all things. And if you are able to do anything, it's because God authorized you to do it. But it comes from God. And who authorized God? 
Nobody. Why? Because God is I am that I am. There's no other foundational being that is prior to God. God is the ultimate. God is the one and only. God is the only transcendent being who is the creator and the one who is the Lord of all providence. He guides everything and all things comes to pass according to God's plans. Now, the, the world is not, not very good at accepting this fact, and there's a constant rebellion. It's very unfortunate that Christians do the same. Now, Christians are making their own authority and saying that we're going to change this into that. We're going to do this rather than that. And by doing all these things, you're basically challenging the one who has the true authority. We cannot say that we did it. We cannot take the credit for anything that had happened because all that comes to pass is because God's authority released it. I want you to know that God is the Lord of authority over your life and my life. You know, there are times when God makes us feel this very acutely. And when is that? When things don't happen the way we want. Things don't happen the way we want. You know, with the pandemic, a number of our church members lost their businesses. And I, I, I visited them, and, and, and some of them I spoke over and over again, and how frustrating it is that, that the landlord does not help the situation. The customers can't do so much. You know, the materials don't arrive on time. There's no worker to come and help because there's a shortage in that too. I mean, it's going all over the place, and people resort to finally closing the business and they said I had it they have to face early retirement and it's frustrating why is it frustrating because they can't do anything about it there's there's no room to maneuver and though it's hard it, it's a very difficult reality but I think in in a, in a positive way if we could ever bring that into our view is that those are the moments when we truly experience that without the authorization of God there's nothing that we can do Sometimes it comes in health crisis. It comes in academic struggles. It comes in a number of ways. I do what I do because God authorized it for me. So don't ever assume that everything is up to you because that is not the kind of faith that we have. We believe in the lordship of our God. The second is God's control. It's amazing what it says in verse 36, and throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day that it was taken up. Complete control of all their movements. So it's like saying to God, God, we will go when you say go. We will stop when you say stop. We can never go ahead of you. We have to follow you, and you are the one who initiates. You are the Lord. This is complete reversal from what? Golden calf that they made earlier. Why? Why did they make the golden calf? The reason why they made the golden calf was so that they could control God. They had their own time plan, and they wanted to go ahead of God and basically bring God along. Control him, manipulate him the way you want things to happen. And that's why it's called the idol. It's a dumb idol. It can't do anything. There's no lordship in that. All, it, all there is is a, a potential for manipulation. And very unfortunately, people use religious credential for that reason. And if there's any of us who forget that the very spirit of the Reformation is that we don't fall into that. We don't fall into a, a human-centered religion where we control the agenda and God comes along as a support. And that kind of religion must be turned upside down at every point. Unfortunately, we still harbor that in our hearts because we are idol makers in our heart. We are the factory for idol, as Augustine said. We have issues. We love to control everything ourselves and say we did it. But the Lordship of God says something very different. Thirdly, there's the presence. 
And that is displayed in verse 38. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, the fire was in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. For the 40 years at the very center of their camp, there stood the tabernacle, and on it was the pillar, the glory pillar, glory pillar, the glory cloud, as a pillar that stood firm. And uh, it was seen by all people. During the daytime, it was a bright cloud. At nighttime, it shone like a fire, a pillar of fire. That's why they call it the pillar of fire. But it was actually the glory of God that is shining even through the night. You know how the cloud at the nighttime is dark, but this cloud was not like the cloud. It was a complete um, uh, uh, presenta re representation of God's glory. And can you, can you imagine what that would look like in the middle of the night? What they cannot get away, they, they cannot get away is, is the very presence of God and the Lordship of God teaches us that, as the psalm says, where can we go from your presence? We could hide from one place to the other, but we can never get away from your presence. You are present in us. You know, those of us, and I hope all of us who can believe that, that we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us and the Lordship of God is very much at work in us and around us, we would confess, God, you are ever present with me. You are in me, you are around me, you stand with me, and your presence is what makes me possible to stand through trials, through tears, through agonies of life. Through the 40 years of wilderness journey for the lifetime of many hardships and challenges, we can stand because God's lordship over us comes with this glorious, merciful, loving presence of the King in my life. That's what we see in this passage. The, the, the cloud is not there to simply wow you and say, well, that's really interesting. It's not about interest. It's about the very person and the being of God and His intention who He is as the Lord. The glory cloud is a manifestation of God in the way that was visible at this time for the people of God. Okay, from here, I'm going to take you a little further on. A little bit about the history of the tabernacle. Okay, so here, the great, some, or great end of the book of Exodus, the glory cloud descending upon the tabernacle. So what happens to the tabernacle? You know the history of it, right? The tabernacle gets worn out, right? By the time of David, David feels really bad. The tabernacle is just sitting there outside of his palace, and he's dwelling in this great palace, and the tabernacle looks kind of shabby. So what he decides to do, what does he do? He, said, he, he, he tells God, God, I want to build a house for you, something more sturdy. And the whole drama goes by, and then finally... David is not able to do it, but he prepares everything for his son Solomon. And when Solomon assumes the throne, he builds the temple. He builds it. And that temple was beautiful. It was, it was really an aesthetically, amazingly pleasing place that everyone just marveled at the beauty of this temple. People became very proud of what they've done by building this temple. But they've forgotten what it's all about. It's about the Lordship of God. They forgot. It was about God's authority, control, and presence. And they turned it into something that's completely unfitting of God's people. So, in time, Nebuchadnezzar, the great emperor of Babylon, came and completely decimated the temple. Only 70 years later, with Zerubbabel as the governor, Joshua as the priest, Haggai and Zechariah as the prophets, they were able to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. 
It was the second temple. And that second temple was built on the old foundation, but people were so sad because it did not resemble the beauty of the first temple. There came a man named Herod. He was a, a king, but he was like a puppet king under the reign of the Roman Empire. He ruled over Judea. And in order to earn favor from the Jews, he actually en embarks on a massive project of adding on to the second temple. And this is called the Herod's Temple, but it's actually the second temple still. It's an expansion version, but the expansion, I'm sure, was bigger and grander than the original building that stood there. It's a huge renovation. And this is the temple at the time when Jesus was doing ministry on this earth. This is the temple to which the disciples said, look, Jesus, isn't this glorious? Isn't this beautiful? Look at those, look, look, look at those stones, how big and marvelous they are. But do you remember what Jesus said? Time will come when there will not be a, a stone on top of a stone. It'll be completely destroyed, and it did. With the advancement of General Titus, with the Roman army, to put down the Jewish revolt in AD 70, Jerusalem was completely ransacked by the Romans, and the temple was completely destroyed, AD 70, 70 AD. And for the last 2,000 years, there's no temple. Only thing that stands, as I hear, is the wailing wall, just a little piece of the remnant. Okay, this is the history of the temple. Then the question is, what is God doing? What will God do? I'll tell you what God's ultimate plan is. So if you go to Revelation 21, there comes the New Jerusalem, the very last glorious city. It, it, in fact, it's a representation of the whole new heaven and new earth. This is where God will reign forever and ever with his people. And it's amazing that in this new Jerusalem, there's no temple. That's, that's what it says precisely. In that city, there was no temple. And it gives a reason why. Because Lord God is their temple. And the Lamb, Jesus Christ, is their temple. Now, what does that mean? Okay, this is what I think it means. It means that no more a building, no more a tent. The glory of God is not going to come and fill a house. But in the final day, the glory of God will come and fill the whole earth. In other words, the, everything will become the temple of God. It's not like there's no temple. It's that everything, the glory of God expands. The glory cloud fills the whole earth, the whole universe. And everybody and every inch of everything that is there will experience the outshining of the glory of God over all things. What do you think about that? You know, I, 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 I long for that day. I, I mean, do I sound pious when I say it? Do I sound like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of exaggerating? Isn't it much better to extend this time that we have right here? Well, I enjoy what I've got by God's grace. I love the authorization of God for me to do different things. So this is wonderful, but I still ache. I still have pain. I have issues with life. I have issues when missionaries are, hand, uh, uh, are, are kidnapped by terrorists in, in Haiti and when things that are awful are going on in various parts where there's a radical movements are going on. The, even in the U.S., I, I don't know what's going on. I, are we kind of feeling frustrated and anxious about all the stuff that's going on? Will everything be perfectly fine when the pandemic finally lift? Really? Will everything will be great for your children and your grandchildren? Will the, will the earth be the same as it is now in terms of climate change and all that stuff? All these stuff. And, and just over and over again, we struggle with the problem of human sin. My sin. I love Jubilee as our church, but I want something more because God planned it. God told us. 
I long for the day when, as the water fills the sea, the knowledge of God will fill the whole earth. I look forward to the day when there will be no more psychological, intellectual conflict in our minds because the world constantly challenges us that way. I long for the day when the total justice will be established on earth. I long for the day when the mercy of God prevails over all things. I long for the day that all our frustrations will end, all our anxieties will melt away, all our fears will be gone. We will not be terrorized by the, the extreme severe thunderstorms and the, and the hurricanes and tornadoes and floods. But all of these things will come to that final great conclusion according to God's plan, where in the last day, God's Sabbath rest and God's shalom peace will prevail throughout the whole universe. And you will be fine. You are welcome there. And you might say, well, I love being married to this man, this woman. What will happen to our relationship? I love being in love. Will that be there when we go to heaven? I could borrow C.S. Lewis. It's like comparing true love with chocolate. You are dealing with chocolate right now. So when you enter into heaven, it'll be real thing. Don't worry about it. You will be there. All the achings and trials will end. If you're struggling with the loved ones that are going through a very hard time, that will end. There will be complete remake of the world and even us. We look forward to that day don't we? I do. And this is what Jesus said, pray this way, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, because right now the throne of God is eternally established firmly still in heaven. That new Jerusalem will come down from heaven for us one day. We pray thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. I want to close with just one other thought. Now I have a number of different angles to this passage, and maybe it's confusing. I hope not. But this last thing is this. But what's going on now, okay? So we wait for that great final temple, which is the whole universe shining, uh, completely outshined by God's glory. What about now? What about now? Where do we see the glory of God now? We see the glory of God, according to Paul, on the face of our resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the one who holds that glory, and from his face we receive the glory. We get that in our hearts. There's, there's a real mystery to this resurrection glory. Are we already part of this resurrection glory? Now, you have to really believe this. The Bible says yes. It's a glory of resurrection that begins from your inner person. Your inner person. That's, that's the language. Inner person, outer person. Paul said your outer body or outer person is wasting away. It's getting old. Like a tent. It's getting worn out. But Paul says your inner person is already in the resurrection project, in the hands of the Holy Spirit. And your inner person is being renewed every day. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Already. And Paul said, we look for the day when our earthly, earthly tent will be put off. Like what we witness whenever we have funeral viewings, the tent put off. What's left behind is a tent. But in God's amazing compensation, there's going to be some connectedness. We don't know exactly how it's going to be done, but there will be a new tent from heaven that will come down on us. And we shall be glorious as Jesus is glorious. But for the time being, we live this 
inner regeneration. I have to say amen to this, you know, because it's not always easy to experience this without faith. But if you can experience this with faith, look at what this means. It means the glory cloud is in us. And what does that mean? That means God's authority, God's full influence, God's dominance is already here inside of us. We have to acknowledge it. God, you are the one with authority, not me. My life is yours. I am your temple. That's why Paul said, do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? He said it in two, two, two occasions, 1 Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 6, same chapters, chapter number, but 1 and 2 Corinthians. In the 1 Corinthians, he talks to the one, a Christian who's unfortunately fallen into sexual immorality. And Paul says, how can you do that with your body when it is the temple of the Holy Spirit? That's a shocking statement. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Do not be partners with unbelievers. Why? Because how can Christ become a partner with the demon? Now, I mean, he's going far with this, but I think there must be something there in the Second Corinthian context where the people were compromising their identity for the sake of earthly gain. And Paul said, do you not know you are the temple of God? You are a temple of God already. We have to accept. What do we have to accept? Accept the fact that by the Holy Spirit, we fully belong to God. He has authority over us. And then He's the one who is controlling our life and our destiny. He's, he loves to do it. God, you take responsibility over us. And we will go when you say go. We will stop when you say stop. And also God's glorious presence is with you and me. That's what this text is about. I mean, I, I, I took you all over the Bible from beginning to the end, but that's, that's what this is about. This is not about some strange cloud descending on a strange-looking tent. It's about the Holy Spirit living and working in you. And that will be completely fulfilled and absolutely finalized when the glory in you will be glory that fills the whole universe. We look forward to that day. Don't we want it? I do. But for now, take this great reality to your heart and live it out. You are precious. You are precious. It took nine months to, for this tent to be complete. It took seven years for Solomon's temple to be complete. It's going to take your lifetime to complete your temple. But it's initiated by God's grace, and He will complete it by His grace. May the Lord have you for his glory. Let's pray.